Good morning, church, or good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you're watching this. I often say at All Saints that uh, I love to envision that if we squinted our eyes a bit, uh, that we could see more than the people that are gathered around. We could see all of those uh, stories and people who represent every gouge or mark in our pew, uh, the people that um, maybe were the first to sit in these pews, or the people who raised their parents, uh, uh, their children who became parents and became Sunday school teachers, and that the story of the church uh, would come to life. I look out and I see all of you. Um, and I hope whether your pew is a, is a couch or a chair in your living room or at your dining room table uh, that you look out, that you squint your eyes just enough uh, to see that you are part of a gathered assembly, the church. Uh, and we are the church, uh, whether we are outside this space uh, or, not, or not. In fact, we are especially the church. And I have been heartened by incredible stories of the church being just that, the church. Uh, when our vestry members and uh, pastoral care team and staff members uh, have called your households, I, I hear stories of people uh, reaching out, uh, already making calls to one another, checking in on those um, uh, that have particular needs. And if you have a particular need, please let us know. Uh, and uh, if there is somebody on your mind uh, don't let them stay just on your mind. Uh, find their phone number. Use Realm. Uh, give them a call. Um, see if they need help with their groceries or just, uh, or just would like to hear a voice, a friendly voice. And uh, um, If you look in the weekly news, I encourage you to do that. Uh, there is uh, some questions and answers, some of the questions that people have asked me over the last couple weeks uh, that I've uh, uh, assembled answers uh, to. There are some things that you can do during this season, whether uh, to serve other people, uh, whether to take care of folks within uh, the church or in the community, uh, whether it's your own uh, spiritual and, and physical health. As some people have donated um, their property uh, for walking and, and, uh, and, and just some time to get out uh, in, a, in a quiet and, uh, and uh, less traveled place than our, our public areas. So, so please take a time to, uh, to look at the weekly news. If you don't get the weekly news, let us know that as well uh, so that we can make sure that you get it. But uh, we, um, we care, we miss you, and uh, we can't wait till we're gathered uh, together again. And uh, the bishop's most recent statement has been uh, that it will be uh, after May 8th. That, that date is, is, is possibly a moving date, uh, but at, at this current juncture, uh, they are predicting that May 8th, uh, uh, will, we are at least close to May 8th, that I can say. We're at least close through May 8th, uh, which, as we talked about last week, means Holy Week. Uh, and we will, uh, and we are uh, making uh, arrangements to, to, to bring Holy Week to you in a, uh, in a different way, but hopefully a meaningful way, in a, a way that, um, that you can uh, continue uh, to walk through those days of Holy Week in your house uh, in a way maybe you haven't in years past. And uh, without a lot of the distractions, without spring break uh, 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 taking you away or, um, uh, or uh, all those other things that spring presents, sports and activities, uh, maybe uh, this might be an occasion for you to walk more intentionally through Holy Week. Maybe, uh, maybe your house becomes uh, the chapel with which you walk through all of these liturgies. And you'll hear more about it, but we are uh, making efforts to make this a very intentional uh, and hopefully a very meaningful Holy Week, even though we can't be together. Um, and so, so there's those and a few other announcements about, um, about uh, uh, how, to, how to care for yourself uh, and uh, just some questions and answers about the church during this season. So I encourage you to w read the weekly news uh, and to take care of one another. And if there's uh, creative ways that we can take care of one another better, uh, please uh, text or email me and, and let me know. And, and our vestry is, and our leadership teams are all uh, ready to help in any way we can. So, uh, so thank you for being church. And now uh, I'd like to pray the collect of the day and then, and then pray, for what, pray for what's on our hearts and minds. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. This is the prayer for the fifth Sunday in Lent. Almighty God, 
you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us pray for the mission of the church, for the world, and for all of those needs, known and unknown. And I'm going to start our prayers with a litany uh, for what's heavy on all of our minds and hearts, um, uh, the response and the effect of the coronavirus. And then as we pray, I'll leave silence for us to offer up uh, prayers that may be related or, or maybe other things going on in our lives that, that, that need a special prayer, but we'll lift all of those up to God. So let us pray. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May those who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May those who have the flexibility to care for our children when schools close remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel a trip remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market remember those who have no margin at all. May those who settle for quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love during this time. When we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace to God and our neighbor. Now I invite our own prayers. For this community, that we continue to protect one another, to reach out to one another to assure each of us that you are present, that you are palpably in our lives, and that you are a God of healing, of hope, and of wonder. Be with all those who risk their health, possibly their lives to care for others, our emergency workers, our essential staff. Be with all those who are alone. All those trying to make sense of these days to young children to all those who need to feel the light on their cheek and know that you are good and that you are present. For our oneness, not just in this church community, not just in this town or this commonwealth, but the oneness we have realized that stretches around the globe. May we continue to hold on to that spirit of oneness, that sense that we are all in this together, that we are all God's beloved. For you, and whatever you're going through.
pray these prayers and all those prayers that are on our heart and known to you alone in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going to go there again? Jesus answered, are not there 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. Those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death. But they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, 
where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, do I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My instinct is still to say, please be seated. Uh, it, it is never going to get easy to preach to an empty church. But as I said, it's only empty physically. It is filled with the spirit of all of you. And we are a gathered assembly. And I do realize that as we've been gathered in this unique way that I have been preaching, uh, what would be fair to say uh, is not necessarily uh, linear preaching. The sermons haven't necessarily had a laser focus, and I haven't necessarily chosen one particular direction and stayed with it. If asked, what did Ben preach about this morning, all of it might be the clearest answer. Part of it is that each one of these Gospels during this uh, season of Lent, during this year A, the, catech uh, 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 the catechetical uh, readings are incredibly long and incredibly rich and incredibly full, but that's not all of it, and I'm sorry. But part of it is that these stories speak to me in such profound ways that I can't just clip away 90% of it and just hone in to that one particular piece. So much of what I need to hear right now would be on the cutting room floor. The other part of it is that I feel a lot right now. I feel a lot of different things, so many things. I need a God who comes to me in multiple ways, in more than one way. I need a God who reaches and knows and is present in all of the confusion, the anxiety, uh, the desire to lead, the insecurity about what's next. All of it. I need a God who's with me. And I need a story or a myriad of stories that come to me in all of the different ways and nourish and comfort and feed me when I am hungry and in all the different ways that I am hungry. So that's my excuse, again, for a sermon that's as much a Bible study as anything else. We have the story of uh, Jesus who is out ministering, out doing the work he was called to do, and he gets word that his beloved friend Lazarus is sick, and not just sick, but at the point of death. And Jesus has work to do. Does he leave uh, the people that he's yet to meet, the, uh, the ministry that he's called to do, to rush to his friend Lazarus' house? Does he choose the particular? Or does he continue his ministry? 
Does he leave those behind to go to the one, or does he stay? And as he stays, it becomes abundantly clear that when Jesus goes, this road is leading to Jerusalem. That when he goes, he will be raising up Lazarus from the dead. He will be this far from Jerusalem at a electric time at Passover. If he goes, he doesn't come back. He tells his disciples that. He says, we are going. Lazarus is asleep. And they didn't quite understand. He says, no, Lazarus is dead and he will be raised. And we are going to Bethany. And Bethany uh, is only less than two miles away from uh, Jerusalem as the crow flies. Uh, it's at the, um, on the side of the Mount of Olives uh, overlooking Gethsemane uh, and overlooking Jerusalem. And it is mixed, tied, embedded in that journey to Jerusalem. When they go to Bethany, they know they are going to Jerusalem. And the disciples say, last time, uh, last time we got anywhere close to there, last time you had any encounter um, uh, with, uh, with the Jewish leadership, they tried to stone you to death. This is a suicide mission. He's already dead. And he says, I need to go. We're going to go. And Thomas, who I defend every Sunday after Easter, says this. This person accused of little faith says this. If you're going, we're all going. Let's go. Even if it leads to death, let's go. I think Thomas may be the patron saint of all of those medical workers who say, I know this may likely lead to me being infected, but let's go. It's what we were trained to do. It's what we were called to do. Let's go. Talk to a parishioner uh, who works at the hospital and talks about the number of days uh, they've been using the same mass um, and the recommendations to clean the mass uh, and that you know, some, of the, uh, some of the indications to clean the mass actually cause them to work less effectively, how under-equipped they are, but they still go. They know that the general population uh, may experience 40 to 70 percent infection, and they know that they are beyond that. But they go. They go because Jesus went. They go because that's what they're called to do. They go because people who are hurting and ill and sick need healing hands and loving hands. They go because they were called to serve. Just as Jesus was called to serve. And Jesus arrives. Jesus arrives, and first he encounters Martha, who is angry and sad, and not just sad, but heartbroken. And Martha says, Lord, we trusted you. We would have done anything for you. We've opened our house to you. We, we followed you, and you weren't here when we needed. I thought that there was something particular about Lazarus, that, uh, that you loved him, that he was your friend, that that you would have done anything, that you could do anything, and you didn't. He's been dead four days. Where were you? Oh, how many times has Jesus heard that? How many times has Jesus heard that? Where were you? Why is this happening? Why couldn't you have spared my loved one? Weren't they special in your eyes? Jesus keeps walking. He sees Mary surrounded uh, by the, uh, the, gathered, uh, the, the gathered community there to console, there to be consoled, all grieving, and he's struck by it. Twice they talk about how deeply he was struck by it, that it hit him in his gut. God's gut was wrenched open. Jesus was torn apart. Not just because of a particular love for Lazarus, but because he saw his people aching. 
aching not just at a sense of loss, but a sense of confusion, of wondering, where was God when I needed God? I think he was aching for so many more than just those gathered around. He was aching and he wept because he lost his friend Lazarus. But he knew that he would rise again. I think as much as anything, Jesus was weeping for us. For us, watching our world torn a little bit upside down. For us who are alone or lost, feeling isolated, unaware that God is so palpably with us, that God wants us so much to feel it. Jesus grieved for our anger at God, for those afflicted, for all who didn't get their miracle story the way that they wanted neatly wrapped. Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps. And they saw him weeping. And they thought, man, he really must have loved Lazarus. Look at him, he's weeping. But why couldn't he save him? And what happened next is so tied to the cross, so nailed to the cross, uh, that it pretty much was the death nail of Jesus' life on this earth. He said, Lazarus, come out. And he knew when Lazarus walked out of that tomb, he would find himself in a tomb. He knew when Lazarus wrapped in those burial, uh, those burial wraps came out that he would very, very, very soon be wrapped himself. He knew that when Jesus took that uh, infirmity away from Lazarus that he put the nails in his hands and in his feet. But he did. And he said, come out. And when he came out, he said this, and this is a sermon unto itself too. He said, unbind him. All of the things that inhibit him, all of the things that weigh us down, all the things that Jesus grieves for us, our anger, our frustration, our confusion, our aloneness, Jesus says, unbind them. And I hope we see how close these stories are. Uh, It was compelling uh, standing in Bethany and seeing how close it was to Jerusalem. To see how close resurrection is to death, how close this story is from the story that they will walk down the mountain to tell. Uh, They even begin that Palm Sunday procession from up on the mountain, uh, down uh, down the Mountain of Olives, uh, into the city of Jerusalem. These stories are held right next to each other. Even the death and life is held next to the story of all time of Jesus' death and new life at the empty tomb. These stories are bound together because those realities are bound together. Suffering and death is always, always so close to hope and compassion and life. Jesus is always so close to both of those experiences. When I hear this story, not only is there incredible foreshadowing of what's to take place, but it reminds me that at every moment of death, every moment of uncertainty, every moment of suffering, that God is there. And that God isn't just there a few minutes too late. God is there because God's very nature It's not just compassion, it's not just love, but it is healing and hope and wholeness when we feel empty or broken. And the story never ends in the tomb. The story never ends on the cross. The story ends with God's glory and God's goodness and God's presence and God's love overcoming all things. Even illness and yes, even death.
Remember that life is short. We have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who traveled away with us. So be quick to be kind. Make haste to love. And the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. now ended and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. God.